good morning or good evening or good afternoon uh, to everybody. This is uh, Dino Patsijalal from Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia, the largest foreign policy group in Indonesia. And we are very happy to welcome all of you today uh, to hear a talk uh, by a good friend of mine, uh, but also what I would consider um, a good source of uh, insights uh, into uh, what is going on in, in Washington, D.C., especially in terms of uh, foreign policy. He is no other than uh, Robert Blake, Ambassador Robert Blake, uh, who uh, served for many years as a distinguished diplomat for the United States. He was ambassador to Indonesia, where he did a phenomenal job. And before that, he was ambassador to Sri Lanka. And he was also the assistant secretary for South and Central Asia. I think he retired, uh, just like me, from the Foreign Service uh, uh, several years ago. And then now uh, he is back in Washington as a senior director at uh, McLarthy and Associates. I'm, I'm very happy uh, to have him here today. He's the first speaker of uh, the new year, 2021. And uh, I'm also happy to announce that today we have over a thousand speakers from about 43 countries. Right. Wow. Uh, not just Indonesia. So uh, quite a few uh, are eager to hear what uh, uh, Bob has to say about uh, Biden foreign policy. And of course, this makes it more interesting given what happened uh, yesterday, the, the terrible uh, uh, attack uh, on Capitol Hill uh, the, that fortunately uh, did not uh, disrupt the certification of uh, the election results uh, that affirm uh, Biden and Kamala Harris as the next president and vice president of the United States. But of course, this raised uh, a lot of questions uh, about what, uh, how does this uh, impact on U.S. foreign policy under under Biden, right? And certainly, uh, for us in this part of the world, as you know, Bob, uh, there's a lot of questions being asked. Uh, what kind of foreign policy president will Biden be? How much time will he have on foreign policy, given the enormous uh, domestic pressures uh, within the United States uh, on COVID-19 and the economy? Uh, what will his first foreign policy move uh, be? Uh, what, how different will it be from uh, foreign policy of President Trump? Definitely, it will be uh, totally different, but how different? Uh, how will it handle China? And for us in this part of the world, we'd love to know what uh, his foreign policy towards Southeast Asia will likely uh, be. So with that introduction, I will give you uh, uh, the microphone. And then after your um, presentation, we will take some uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I may have a few questions before that. And uh, the microphone is yours. Uh, it's good to have you. Sure. Bob. Thank Please. you, Dino. It's really great to be with you. And it's particularly great to be with all of the FPCI audience. Um, I always appreciated the opportunity to, to speak with uh, the foreign policy community of Indonesia. And it's become such an important forum for informing Indonesia's public about uh, global foreign policy issues, but also the importance of, I think, Indonesia exercising a greater role in the world that reflects Indonesia's growing importance in the world. So I always appreciate the chance to speak with your members. Um, as you said, Dino, it seems almost trite to be talking about US foreign policy after the disgraceful storming of the US Capitol yesterday, but I think the important fact is that America's institutions held and all hurdles have now been cleared for Joe Biden to be our next president on January 20th. And of course, I'm happy to discuss that more in the Q&A if there's, if there's interest in that. Let me just start with two quick uh, disclaimers. I'll be sharing a lot of personal judgments today, but I'm speaking purely on a personal basis. These judgments do not reflect the views either of McClarty Associates, where I work, nor am I working with or serving as a proxy for the Biden administration. So um, with that out of the way, I thought I would use my, uh, my time today to uh, give you my sense of the world facing Joe Biden. And I'm not gonna try to pretend to give you a rundown of policy in every corner of the world. We don't have time for that and nor am I qualified for that, but 
after 35 years in government and now in private business, I do have a sense of the, the key issues that he's gonna be focusing on. So first I'll talk about how the world has changed since he left office. Second, discuss some of the, um, sorry, I just lost my, that second, discuss some of the daunting challenges that President-elect Biden will face when he takes office. But then also some of the reasons that I feel optimistic that he and his team are gonna be up to the task. And then most importantly, I'll talk about the big foreign policy issues that are likely to dominate the agenda for his first few months or years, particularly China and Iran, but also some of these global issues like uh, climate and democracy. And then of course, I look forward to taking your questions for what I hope will be a great discussion. So let's jump right in. Many Americans underestimate how much the world has changed in the last four years since Biden and many of his team were last in office. And certainly this is not the world that Joe Biden left in 2016. And he and his team are certainly aware of that. On the economic front, as this slide shows, America remains the leading economic power in the world, but the gap between us and the rest of the world is narrowing, shifting. And in particular, of course, the power of Asia as a whole, led by China and India, is steadily increasing. So the center of gravity is shifting from west to east and from advanced, mostly Western economies to emerging markets. Next slide, please. A second major trend is that authoritarianism has been gaining ground in recent years, reversing the Cold War progress of democratization around the world. Freedom House, which tracks global democratic trends, noticed, no, noted in its most recent report that 2019 marked the 14th consecutive year of decline in global freedom. And the wise Oxford historian, Tim, Timothy Garden Ash, recently observed that for the first time this century, among countries with more than a million people, there are now fewer democracies than there are non-democratic regimes pretty grim statistic. Next slide, please. A third major trend has been the widening of income inequality in many countries, including in the United States and in Indonesia. And this is a complex topic that of course deserves its own separate talk, but in country after country, the top income segments of the population have made huge income gains over the last decade, while the bottom tiers have barely kept their heads above water. And among the reasons that this matters is that in the US and in many other countries, inequality has reduced public support for free trade and globalization and induced many governments to pursue more inward looking policies that often favor onshoring and encouraging both local and foreign companies to localize production. And of course, COVID-19 has worsened this trend. The UN Development Program in December reported that the virus has pushed an additional 200 million people into poverty around the world, so that the overall total is now a billion, which is one sixth of humanity. Again, a, a really staggering number. So let us let me just turn quickly to questions of whether Biden can overcome some of the challenges at home, as Dino alluded to. The president-elect, of course, faces skepticism in many parts of the world about whether he will be able to successfully deal with and overcome challenges in America that could inhibit our ability to lead globally. And let me mention a few of those. Global public opinion polls, for example, rank the U.S. at or near the bottom of rankings of countries for how they've managed the COVID-19 challenge, raising questions about whether the U.S. is as competent and ready to lead as everyone used to believe. There is further concern that America's shaky handling of the coronavirus could delay our economic recovery, that of the world's largest market, but also limit our capacity to resume ambitious foreign aid and climate assistance programs. Still another concern is whether President-elect Biden can overcome the crippling partisanship that has gripped our country over the last years and brought Congress to a near standstill. And many fear that President Trump will continue to have significant influence on the Republican Party, thereby diminishing the space for many Republicans to support more ambitious foreign policy priorities. And many wonder whether President Trump's steady America first isolationism has diminished public support in the US 
for us to resume more of a leadership role in the world. And finally, many wonder whether Biden could be yet another one-term president defeated by Trump or another Republican in 2024, bringing yet another reversal in American policies. So these are all legitimate questions, but I think they're also, there are some reasons for optimism. And let me just mention a few. First, I'm, I'm very, very encouraged by what we've seen so far in terms of the caliber of cabinet secretaries and White House senior staff that Biden is bringing in. Almost without exception, these are exceptionally competent leaders who for the most part bring decades of experience working in and out of government. So for example, President, uh, President's nominee to be Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, was the staff director for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee during Biden's tenure as the chairman of that committee. Um, in the Obama administration, he chaired what is known as the Deputies Committee in his role as the Deputy National Security Advisor. And this is, for those of you who don't know it, it's the committee of key deputy level cabinet leaders who gathered sometimes multiple times a week in the White House Situation Room to hash out all the most difficult foreign policy issues that we were not able to resolve at lower levels. So Tony served in that grueling role from 2013 to 2015 before becoming Secretary of State, Deputy Secretary of State from 2015 to 2017. So he has intimate firsthand knowledge of every single key foreign policy emission, uh, issue that you can imagine. And of course, I had the privilege of hosting Tony for a two day visit to Indonesia while I was ambassador there. So he knows your country very well and has very fond memories of his visit. Likewise, Jake Sullivan, President Biden's choice for national security advisor is widely regarded by career folks like me as one of the brightest thinkers that we ever served with. Um, he served for much of the Obama administration as Hillary Clinton's head of policy planning, and, but he was also a Phi Beta Kappa at Yale, a Rhodes Scholar. Um, and he is, you know, he's always the smartest guy in the room, but he also was somebody who took the time to listen to and learn from the career foreign service. So again, he enjoys just incredible respect from all of us who worked with him. As to the question of whether Americans support America resuming its more traditional leadership role in the world, next slide. I believe they will. Um, sorry, that's the Blinken slide, next one after that. I believe they will. Um, recent polls, such as a study by the Chicago Council on, on Global Affairs, show that close to seven in 10 Americans believe the United States should take a more active role in world affairs. Um, and seven in 10 also believe that US military alliances with other countries contribute to US safety. And this is despite the president, the current president's steady drumbeat of rhetoric against such international engagement. So that's encouraging. At the same time, I think Biden and his team are very conscious of the need for them to do a better job of explaining and making sure that foreign policy is providing concrete benefits to the American people. Another former Deputy Secretary of State and career Foreign Service Officer, Bill Burns, who now leads the Carnegie Endowment, uh, led a study to try to find a way to reconnect US foreign policy to the broader agenda of domestic renewal. So they undertook a systematic two-year survey of three heartland states, Ohio, Colorado, and Nebraska, and talked with a huge range of officials, labor leaders, farmers, small business owners, and came out with a terrific report on making US foreign policy work for the middle class. And Ambassador Burns in a recent op-ed sort of highlighted several of the conclusions and let me just briefly summarize them. One, of course, our foreign economic diplomacy has to aim less simply at opening markets abroad and much more directly at inclusive economic growth at home so that the benefits of our work do not just benefit big American corporations, but also the sm small and medium-sized enterprises who are really the lifeblood of our economy and Indonesia's economy. And part of that has to be to re reinvest in our own competitiveness by enhancing the productivity of our workforce, investing in education and research and development in areas like biotechnology and AI and nanotechnology. And Biden, I think, has pledged to do the exactly this. 
I think a second study conclusion that will be of interest to, to FPCI members was that the people interviewed had no appetite for a new Cold War with China or for a new massive new effort against authoritarian state. Rather, they prefer a more humble, humble foreign policy, a more restrained one about using military force and more focused on using diplomacy. And they believe we, that while we must certainly continue to promote human rights overseas, we have to first rebuild the power of our own example and also be honest about the limits of our ability to transform other societies. And I think again, President-elect Biden would agree with all of that advice. So now let's take the question of whether our country really is in long-term decline. And count me among those who have faith in America's ability to reinvent itself. You know, we have seen periods in the past, um, during the 1980s, when many pundits expressed concern that Japan was going to overtake the United States. Of course, after 9-11, uh, we went through a protracted period. But in each case, subsequent periods brought unprecedented periods of prosperity and innovation. And why is that? Um, Harvard professor Joe Nye and many others have long pointed to the many advantages that the United States enjoys. One, of course, is a young population, and until recently, at least, an open immigration system that I think will return, that refreshes our workforce and our diversity. We're blessed with abundant energy resources that have enabled us to become a net hydrocarbon exporter. We're at peace with our two immediate neighbor neighbors, and we have two large oceans to separate us from others. We have an unrivaled network of strong alliances, a very strong capacity for innovation uh, that is driven by our university system and of course our venture capital system. So America has a lot going for it. And I think we are in a good position to again, uh, reinvent and revitalize ourselves. As to the question of gridlock in Congress, I do th think the situation will be better because Democrats will have control of the White House, the Senate and the House of Representatives, thanks to the two recent elections in Georgia. Although those, uh, the, both the margins in the Senate and the House are gonna be very, very narrow. Um, so we're gonna need a lot of diplomacy on the Hill and Biden brings 36 years of experience as a Senator to the White House. And for many of those years, he worked with Republican colleagues like the current majority leader, Mitch McConnell to get important legislation passed. And uh, he was really, during the Obama administration, kind of the Republican whisperer on the Hill to round up key Republican votes to secure passage of major legislation like the Affordable Care Act. So I think that uh, you know, he's gonna be able to do that again. And, um, and I do think there's scope for quite a number of bills to pass with bipartisan support. And I'd be glad, glad to talk more about that in the Q&A if there's interest. A final point is that Americans overwhelmingly want their members of Congress to work together to get things done and stop arguing. So now that we have an experienced president ready to work on a bipartisan basis, there should be room to really uh, honor that mandate. All right, so let's turn to the issues and in, in some of the countries that are likely to top the foreign policy to-do list of the Biden administration. Uh, of course, we have to start with COVID-19. Biden has been clear from the beginning that job number one for his administration will be to get on top of the coronavirus gripping our country. And um, I don't need to review for you the statistics on all that. You all know them very well. But even as the president and his team encourage more consistent mask wearing and grapple with the logistics of vaccinating as many of our fellow countrymen as quickly and fairly and efficiently as possible, COVID-19 also represents an opportunity for some early foreign policy successes. Um, Samantha Power, our former ambassador to the UN under Obama and a former colleague of mine when I was Assistant Secretary of State, offered some quite useful suggestions in the current issue of foreign affairs. She recommended that Biden start by having the United States join COVAX, the UN Coalition of Global Health Organizations and others who are working together to provide equitable access to COVID-19 treatments and vaccines. And even the best case scenarios acknowledge that uh, with COVAX and other efforts that are underway, only about a quarter of the global population 
is expected to receive a vaccine by the end of 2021. Uh, and that's a, a, a kind of a sad statistic. So the United States is gonna be in a quite unique position to help accelerate that timetable. And we have the unparalleled scientific expertise of the Center for Disease Control and others. And of course, the global reach and expertise of, of institutions like the US Agency for International Development. So I think that uh, we are well positioned to help in that regard. And I think all of these countries and institutions would welcome a leading role by the US given our leadership in the past in responding to global health challenges like the Ebola crisis and the HIV AIDS epidemic. Um, I think the, the COVID crisis also presents a big diplomatic opportunity to work with other countries to think through how to prevent the next pandemic. So next slide, please. Those of you who are in Indonesia will recognize this, this is a, this is a pandolin. Uh, pangolin. And um, COVID-19, like many of the worst diseases in the world, can be traced back to pathogens like a virus that make the jump from animals to human. And that's what happened with Ebola and AIDS and SARS and many, many others. Uh, with COVID-19, there's still a lot of debate about ha what happened, but there's some evidence that a pangolin from Malaysia, such as the one you see here, may have been the carrier, which was then tr illegally trafficked through Vietnam to Kunming and finally to Wuhan. Um, so there's a twofold need here. First, we've got to develop a greater scientific understanding of how these diseases jump from animals to humans. And then we have to do a better job, of course, of stopping the traders who traffic in wildlife. When I was an ambassador in Indonesia, wildlife experts there told me that a um, billion dollars worth of uh, illegal wildlife trade was exported out of Indonesia in one year. And that's, just, and that's just one country. So a truly staggering uh, indicator of the, of the scale of, of, of all of this that is going on. So bottom line is there's much to do on COVID and I think US diplomacy can play a role. A second early opportunity, next slide please, is gonna be to immediately enhance um, global international efforts to address climate change. Um, during the presidential campaign, Biden characterized climate change as an existential threat and the number one issue facing humanity. And in all of the debates and speeches during the campaign, he stressed the opportunity to build a more resilient, sustainable economy that will put the US on a path to achieve net zero carbon emissions no later than 2050. And he pledged to invest $1.7 trillion in renewables, and climate research over the next decade. And of course, he appointed former Secretary of State John Kerry as his climate special envoy. So what can be done? First, in the spirit of how foreign policy can help ordinary Americans, as we ramp up our own clean energy infrastructure and technology, we have an important chance to help our clean energy companies sell their technology and expertise overseas. And that, of course, can create millions of US jobs, and um, our embassies around the world are ready to do just that, to, to help in that regard. Second, Biden and Secretary Kerry have telegraphed their intention to not only significantly increase America's own emission reductions, but also to undertake energetic diplomacy to pressure other countries to make more ambitious reductions at the next UN climate talks in Glasgow, Scotland in 2021. And I think there's considerable scope for that now because other major emitters, China, the EU, Japan, and others, have all announced variants of plans to reach net carbon neutrality at or around 2050. And so as these next charts show, the costs of renewable, next, next chart, please. The costs of renewables such as solar and wind have fallen below those now of coal and gas. So there's a tremendous economic case to make and again, next slide, please. Despite a lot of recent progress, the share of renewables and global electricity generation remains a relatively modest 25%. So there is room to do much more. And in countries like Indonesia itself, there's a big opportunity to scale up renewables. So this opens the door for us to work with these countries, including China, to make joint representations to other major emitters to join in making more reductions. That was the successful formula 
that led to the landmark Paris Agreement in 2015. And the US and China then uh, were the two largest emitters. We agreed on ambitious cuts, and then that created the impetus for the US, the UN, and others to press the rest of the world to match those cuts. Um, so um, third, I think diplomacy has to bring international business into the picture. Unlike in Paris, there has really been a sea change in the way that most big multinational corporations now understand that it's in their interest to integrate climate into their planning. And let me just give you two quick examples. One is Walmart, the world's largest retailer, which has undertaken enormous efforts to reduce not only its greenhouse gas emissions, but those of its supply chain, which of course is vast. The country's chief sustainability officer, Kathleen McLaughlin, announced last month that the company is on track to cut 1 billion metric tons of emissions from its global supply chains by 2030. And to give you just a, a unit of comparison, 1 billion metric tons is 20% of what the US as a whole emitted in 2017 in energy related carbon dioxide. And Walmart is not, not alone. There's now more than a thousand gl global MNCs that have joined a global initiative that's spearheaded by the World Resources Institute, the World Wildlife Fund and others to set what are called science-based emission reduction targets for their, for their companies. So there's, there's a lot of momentum and I, I'm really encouraged and optimistic that there's gonna be, uh, I think more significant progress made in Glasgow. Uh, let me turn to another difficult functional issue that is likely to earn early attention from President-elect Biden, and that's the promotion of democracy and human rights. The Trump administration, as all of you know, largely downgraded this as a priority of U.S. foreign policy, except in cases where it buttressed other priorities, such as Chinese human rights violations against the Uyghurs. And human rights defenders around the world despaired when the Trump administration announced its decision to withdraw from the UN Human Rights Council as part of its wider antipathy toward the UN. And certainly the UN HRC has its faults, but the Obama administration, in my view, widely decided to rejoin the UN HRC in 2009 so we could influence it from within. And I think we were able to do that. So the UN HRC does matter and having the US in it, I think does make a difference to the strength of the institution. So what should we expect from Biden on democracy and human rights? Since reestablishing our moral leadership at, has got to start at home, the president-elect has already talked about some of the steps that he's going to take. And those include immediately ending the horrific practice of separating families at our border. Second, he wants to uh, terminate the Trump administration's travel ban against people from Muslim majority countries. These would be very, very important first steps to show the administration's seriousness and purpose. But to reaffirm America's international leadership, President Biden has also pledged to organize during his first year in office a summit of the world's democracies. And his advisors have said that the summit will seek concrete country commitments in three different areas, corruption, defending against authoritarianism, including election security, and asking countries to advance human rights, not only in their own nations, but around the world. And importantly, this summit would include civil society organizations from around the world, and of course, have a call to action for tech and social media companies to make their own commitments to help preserve open democratic societies. The third functional area I wanna cover is trade. Even though Biden has said he wants first to enhance America's competitiveness, before he considers new deals, trade is an important part of our economy that, so I just really couldn't leave it out. The US Chamber of Commerce estimates that slightly less than 40 million American jobs depend on trade. So our success in opening markets is critical to the success of the US economy and rebuilding our economy. And Biden has clearly stated that before thinking about new trade deals, he wants to negotiate from a position of strength. So he wants first to restore America's competitiveness by scaling up research and development programs, by investing in America's workers, and by improving America's infrastructure. And in his first economic address after the election, he said 
that the United States needs to be aligned with other democracies so that we can set the rules of the road instead of having China and others dictate those outcomes. So he's likely to take a worker focused, a more multilateral approach, of course, that attempts to address national security, but also domestic job security. So for example, he has said he is not going to immediately move to reduce the 25% tariff that Trump imposed on roughly half of China's exports to the United States, but he will conduct a full review of the phase one agreement. And more importantly, he will consult with Asian and European allies to develop a current, a co more coherent strategy so that we can enhance our collective leverage. And I think that is very, very important to, to note because a lot of what Trump tried to do, he tried to do by himself and he just really didn't get very far in any of it. The tough question for Biden will be whether to rejoin the Trans-Pacific Partnership or its successor, the CPTPP. There is increased skepticism, I will tell you, in Congress about trade agreements and any changes that are proposed by the Biden administration would have to be approved not only by Congress, but also by the other 11 countries. So that's a fairly heavy lift. And that's one of the reasons that trade is on the medium term horizon. So now let me turn to some of the key countries that are likely to be the focus of early diplomacy, starting with China and Iran. America's most important rival, of course, for global influence now is China. And attitudes towards China have undergone a big change in recent, in recent years. For many years, as Dino will recall, the US sought to engage China because the prevailing wisdom was that as China was admitted into global institutions like the World Trade Organization, and as China developed, the odds were that China would slowly develop a more market-oriented economy, it would provide more democratic opportunities for its people, and it would become in the world, in the words of former World Bank President Bob Zelik, a quote, responsible stakeholder. Well, that strategic bet proved wrong. Both Republicans and Democrats now agree that instead of becoming a responsible stakeholder, China has doubled down on using illegal subsidies, protectionism, cheating on trade rules, forced technology transfers, stealing of intellectual property, all policies that leaders on both sides of the congressional aisle, I'll agree need to be confronted. China under President Xi Jinping has also undertaken a made in China 2025 plan that has offered massive subsidies to make China's private and state owned companies world leaders in areas like supercomputing, AI, 3D printing, facial recognition software, robotics, electric cars, I can go on and on. So it is a formidable competitor on these fronts. And yet China is not the fearsome superpower that is seeking to take over the world that many Americans seem to believe. China faces a series of internal challenges. One of is, is demographic decline because of its previous one child per family policy. A second is that President Xi's reassertion of state controls over the economy is expected to undermine future growth, as is capital flight by wealthy Chinese who are moving hundreds of billions of dollars offshore, and environmental degradation that is stunting agricultural production and the health of the Chinese people. And those same bureaucrats who are leading the Made in China 2025 effort are also the ones who are directing bank loans and subsidies to often inefficient state-owned enterprises and infrastructure projects with no real plausible rates of return, giving China a potentially destabilizing stock of debt. And in addition, I think uh, China's top university, Peking University, falls behind 50 American universities, while professors uh, and students at Chinese colleges aren't allowed really to write or speak freely. And only one in three Chinese adults aged 20 to 64 have attended high school, well below the 90% average in high income countries like the US or Germany, according to research from Stanford University. And while overseas Chinese programs such as the Belt and Road Initiative has certainly created goodwill in many countries, it's also true that China's aggressive policies in the South China Sea 
its recent aggression in the Himalayas, its wolf warrior diplomats who unabashedly hit back at any criticism of China or the Communist Party, leave many partners uneasy and seeking a warmer economic and sometimes military embrace from the US, Japan, Korea, and others, so that these countries do not become dependent on and at the mercy of China. And I think global opinion polls bear that out. Next slide, please. This, this chart shows that while global confidence in our president, current president Trump, is not high, President Xi also inspires very little confidence. In contrast to president, presidential campaigns of the past, China figured really only sporadically in the Trump-Biden campaign, mostly because both sides shared a relatively similar view of the threats that China posed. And I've already talked about those. And for all of Trump's and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's bluster, their China policy for the most part led to larger US trade deficits, little to no increase in manufacturing jobs in the US, and diminished US influence in Asia. So what is China policy likely to look like under President-elect Biden? Under Trump, who pursued an increasingly confrontational approach with China, uh, sorry, unlike Trump, Biden is likely to favor a steadier and more coherent China policy that puts a premium on coordinating with the EU, Japan, South Korea, and other friends to maximize our chances for success while leaving open the possibility of working with China on global issues like climate change. And although Biden, when he was vice president, got to know President Xi quite well, his own attitude is hardened. He termed Xi a thug during the election campaign, for example. And I think it likely that the Biden team will, will restore a high level strategic dialogue between our two governments, similar to what the Obama administration conducted, but was abandoned by Trump. And as to some of the specific policies that we might anticipate, I expect Biden's economic team will continue to push back strongly on Chinese illegal subsidies and protectionism and some of these other things that I talked about earlier that hurt American companies doing business in China. He's likely to continue freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea and oppose China's militarization of the disputed islands in, in that area. And of course, he's gonna continue our engagement with the Quad countries like Australia, India, and Japan. Um, I think he's gonna probably continue US advocacy on behalf of the Uyghurs and those in Hong Kong who are seeking to preserve Hong Kong's special status. And as I mentioned earlier, I think we will see the new administration seek to coordinate with China on climate, but China should also expect pressure for them to cease both their exports of coal-fired power plants and their own plans to construct new ones domestically. Republican and Democratic hawks on China are also likely to press for what is known as economic decoupling, that many feel is a way that we can reduce any dependency on Chinese technology and weaken China's economy. My own sense is that we are likely to continue the decoupling process on semiconductors but on other products, I think Biden is more likely to try to increase the competitiveness of US products by boosting research and development spending, for which I think there would be Republican support. And why do I say that? I think it's because the Chinese market is just too important for our companies to pursue more comprehensive decoupling. So um, I think that enhancing our ability to compete is really the right way to go. Um, Enough on China. Let me let me turn to the Middle East and Iran, which is always a, a flashpoint in American foreign policy. Perhaps one of the most important and difficult decisions that President-elect Biden will face will not be China, but it'll be Iran. Jake Sullivan, his uh, his incoming national security advisor, said in a recent interview that if Iran comes back into compliance with the 2015 nuclear deal by, for example, dismantling the required number of uh, centrifuges, then the US will also return to the Iran agreement known as the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. And you will recall that this was the deal that was negotiated between Iran and the five permanent, permanent members of the UN Security Council, as well as Germany and the EU in 2015. 
And under that accord, China, uh, Iran agreed to limit its sensitive nuclear activities and allow in international inspectors in return for the lifting of crippling economic sanctions. And of course, Trump withdrew from that deal as one of his very first acts as president. However, as with the case of many Trump's of Trump's policies, his go it alone policy in Iran really produced very few positive results. And in fact, has allowed Iran to move much closer to the point where they'll be able to develop a nuclear weapon faster now than if they'd continued to abide by the deal's restrictions. Um, I should also mention that circumstances have changed on both sides. One is that Iran continues to develop new missile and drone capabilities that arguably pose as much or more of an immediate threat than any putative nuclear weapon. And this was demonstrated last September when Iran launched drones and cruise missile strikes against several important Saudi Arabian oil fields and processing centers, causing widespread damage. And as New York Times columnist Tom Friedman observed, the Iranian drones and cruise missiles flew in with such stealth that neither their takeoff nor their impending attack was detected in time, either by Saudi or US radar, stunning analysts in the region. And since the Gulf Arabs and Israel are now clearly much more affected by Iran's military and other destabilizing activities, the US and other signatories of the original deal will face the difficult question of whether these countries also should be brought into the negotiation, which of course would make an already complex negotiation even more difficult. It is this more dangerous Iran that of course has been a driver of recently successful efforts by the Trump administration, excuse me, to forge new peace deals between Israel, the UAE, Bahrain and Sudan. And there, are Sud and there are signs that Saudi Arabia may also be considering a peace agreement, possibly before Trump leaves office, but that seems increasingly unlikely. The wider dynamic here is that Iran has been expanding its support to proxies, as we see in this, in this slide here, in Lebanon, in, in Yemen, in Syria, and Iraq. And so Israel, understandably, is concerned that Iran is encircling it through these proxies and then arming them with missile capabilities. And of course, Iran has its own considerations that may limit its willingness to re-enter talks. Iran was enraged when suspected Israeli agents recently uh, were reported to have assassinated the father of Iran's nuclear weapons program. And that attack, of course, put pressure on Iran's president, Rouhani, to retaliate. But he knows that that would risk a wider escalation by Israel and potentially retaliation by the United States itself. And the, the attack also hardened the attitude of hardliners inside Iran who opposed the nuclear deal to begin with and have always argued that negotiating with the West is a fool's errand. So this combustible mix poses very, very difficult questions for Biden and his team. Um, and I think the good news is that the Trump sanctions have reduced Iran's oil exports by more than half since 2016. So Tehran is anxious to get these sanctions lifted. Um, and Jake Sullivan also said that if Iran re-enters compliance with the Iran deal and the US re-enters, that could then provide the basis for follow-on negotiations, both on missile capabilities, ballistic missile capabilities, but also potentially to follow on conversations between the original negotiators and what he called regional players. He didn't spell that out. The other thing to note, I think, is that the Biden team can hit the ground running on this issue. Many of the key negotiators, including Jake Sullivan himself and the incoming Deputy Secretary of State designate, Wendy Sherman, will be coming back into government. So they bring enormous experience and knowledge to this, and uh, again, can hit the ground running. Um, I could cover a whole bunch of other issues, but I don't wanna take up too much of my time. So I'd like to just conclude my talk by discussing a subject near and dear to my heart, which is how the Biden administration can rebuild the State Department to be the spearhead for all of these initiatives that I've discussed today. 
One of our best secretaries of state that I ever worked for, Colin Powell, used to say that we are strongest when the face of America isn't a soldier carrying a gun, but a diplomat negotiating peace, a Peace Corps volunteer bringing clean water to a village, or a relief worker stepping off a cargo plane as flood wa waters rise somewhere. Um, and from the beginning of his administration, President Trump sought to weaken the State Department by proposing 30% cuts to the department's budget, appointing an unprecedented percentage of political appointees as ambassadors and to key sub-cabinet positions, or simply leaving many key positions unfilled. So no wonder then that morale in the State Department is at an all-time low. And this grim picture motivated two of our most heralded undersecretaries of state, Ambassador Nick Burns and Ambassador Mark Grossman, to undertake a detailed study of how to rebuild a strong and high-performing foreign service to defend our country and advance our interests in the 21st century. So under the auspices of the nonpartisan American Diplomacy Project at the Harvard Kennedy School, they met over the past year with more than 200 people uh, serving and retired State Department officers, business leaders, senior military officers, including two former chairmen of the Joint Chiefs, two former CIA directors, et cetera, et cetera. And the, and the resulting blueprint makes 10 principal re recommendations. I won't go through all of them, but the goal is to create a stronger and more nonpartisan foreign service by expanding the number of ambassadorial and senior Washington assignments for career professionals. Uh, specifically, they, they recommend that they uh, constitute 70% of all ambassadorial positions. Traditionally, it's been about uh, 70%. So, so 90, 70 would go up to 90. But they also wanna initiate in a complete overhaul of our personnel system to make it more modern, flexible, transparent, and so forth. And all of these are gonna be very, very sensible, long overdue reforms that I think Biden and Secretary of State Designate Blinken are likely to embrace, as will career officers of the State Department. Now, I realize I haven't talked about US-Indonesia relations, but I'm of course happy to address those in the Q&A if there's interest. Likewise, I'm happy to talk about cybersecurity, Russia, North Korea. But let me just sum up by saying that as President Biden enters office at this exceptionally difficult time, I believe that with the superb foreign policy team that he's assembling, the reservoir of goodwill he is likely to generate from a world that's gonna be grateful for America's re-engagement. And by reinvigorating the State Department, America will once again have the opportunity to lead and make a difference in the world. So again, Dino, thank you so much for this opportunity. And um, I look forward to a great discussion with the audience. So over back to you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Bob, for that very excellent, uh, comprehensive uh, presentation containing many good information and also deep uh, insights. And uh, you know, let me ask a few questions, Bob. Sure. Uh, uh, one is the uh, emphasis on democracy uh, that Biden administration will have, especially uh, with the possible launching of the democracy summit. Uh, yeah. In 2021, right? Yeah. Uh, how how will Biden uh, advance the democracy agenda without uh, looking uh, selective and inconsistent? What what I mean is that they would pressure certain countries on dem democracy issues, but on other countries such as those in the Middle East. Uh, they would either turn the other cheek or be very soft. You know, uh, this has been noticed by by uh, yeah. you know countries outside the United States. So how do Absolutely. you uh, escape that 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 impression? How do they would uh, escape that? Well, yeah, I mean, I think and I think that's a very fair point. And certainly under the Trump administration, as I mentioned, um, human rights were subordinated to more strategic issues, and so they they used them when they was it was useful for for other things, but they weren't a priority in their own right. And I think that will, will change under this administration. But I think it, I'm encouraged that he said that we've got to rebuild the power of our own example first, because we've, <laughs> we've suffered some, some, some serious um, uh, blows to our own credibility. And I think uh, so I'm, I'm happy to hear that he's 
he's going to start with that uh, priority. But I, I agree with you. We, you know, we, we do need to have a consistent foreign policy that treats everybody equally. But, you know, the reality is, you know, you know, around the world, um, our strategic interests are different uh, in every part of the world. And, you know, sometimes you're not going to, you, you need a country to do something or you want them to uh, be a part of a big initiative. So, so maybe you're not going to poke them in the eye directly publicly for what they're doing public. But I can assure you that American diplomats under Biden will be working behind the scenes on, on democracy and human rights issues. They may differ slightly on what they say publicly about these things. But I do think there will be more uh, consistency of application uh, under the Biden administration. And the fact that he's making this a priority and talking about this big summit, I think itself is an important sign of, of the priority he's going to devote to this. Yeah. And, and what do you say to uh, those who might say that the, the emphasis on, on democracy and human rights in some countries would make the United States less competitive vis-a-vis uh, -vis China? Because, uh, you know, China, you know, obviously these issues are not at the forefront of their foreign policy agenda. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the countries uh, would say, hey, you know, fine, if you pressure us on those, uh, we got China uh, offering uh, this and well, that. It, it, I, I see, I hear you. And it's true, you know, I mean, I think one, one of the issues that we grappled with when, when I was Assistant Secretary of State and afterwards was that in, in South and Central Asia, was that the Chinese were already beginning these very large programs under the Belt and Road Initiative and were giving these, uh, these loans and other programs without any kind of conditions whatsoever. And many of these countries like the Maldives, which at that point was going through quite a difficult tumultuous transition, kind of said to India and the United States, fine, if you're gonna try to force us to uh, abide by your human rights uh, principles, we'll just go to the Chinese. And so it had the practical impact, at least on the part of the Indians, of, of diminishing a little bit their willingness to, uh, to talk about human rights issues because they didn't want to lose strategic space to the Chinese. So it, it, does, it does have an impact, but uh, I think that, you know, again, we have, to, we have to stand up for our principles. Uh, maybe we'll be a little bit more careful how we do these things publicly versus privately, but I do think, um, the, the world would benefit from a return to a more vigorous American advocacy of, of democracy and human rights because of the, you know, really distressing trends that we've seen over the last 20 years. Yeah. Well, Bob, I just finished reading the book by uh, Bob Gates, The Exercise of Power. And yes, I haven't read it, but I got good reviews. Yeah, I, I, it really, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a very a good book. I would advise uh, people to, to read it. But there was one point that uh, Bob Gates made in that book. Uh, uh, he said that uh, there was a time when Obama held a meeting with his uh, advisors and they look at uh, how much Russia uh, allocated money for public diplomacy and how much China allocated money for, for public uh, diplomacy, a huge uh, amount. And then uh, Obama asked, can we match that? You know, and the answer was no way. You know, in other words, uh, the US spends a very minuscule amount on public diplomacy relative right. to Russia and, and China. Is, is that something that's gonna be fixed? Uh, because diplomats can only do so much, but without the right. budget, or you know you can't do much of it. Yeah, yeah. I, I hope so. I think public diplomacy has 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 really um, suffered uh, some significant cuts in it in its budget. And you know we define public diplomacy not just in terms of how do you, um, for example, promote your policies overseas and so forth, but also the very very important education and cultural exchanges that I think have a much greater long term impact. Um, on changing people's attitudes. I used to, to talk, my favorite program when I was in Indonesia was something called the Youth Exchange Program, uh, the YES program. And it brought um, 80 Indonesian high school students that were in their junior year of high school to the United States for a year. And they would live with a host family in tiny little towns all over the United States. And I would meet with them before they left and then I would meet them after they'd come back. And the transformation 
in these kids was just incredible. You know, they were sort of on, before they wouldn't make eye contact, they didn't really speak English. They came back just buzzing with excitement about their, their, their time in the United States. They couldn't wait to go back to, to, to study again at, at universities. And they were gonna become like mini ambassadors in their little communities about the United States. And, and I think in, in, in those kind of programs, people don't understand how, how impactful they are. So I think the public diplomacy has to be understood from this wider perspective. And I hope that we do give it more of a priority because it, it does matter. And as you say, our, uh, uh, the people that we're competing with are putting significant resources into their own programs. Yeah. Well, do you think uh, President Trump, uh, once he retires after January 20th, will continue to heckle uh, President Biden on foreign policy issues? Uh, you know, President uh, George Bush was pretty quiet after he retired no. uh, and so on, even Bill Clinton too. But uh, do you see Trump becoming a still continuing loud noise uh, after? I, I think Trump will try. I, he's not going to have the same bully pulpit that he did before, so it's going to be a little bit harder for him. And I think the other uh, factor that he's going to have to face is that he's going to face some quite serious legal challenges, particularly in the state of New York, that he's going to have to deal with. And you know, we'll we'll have to see what the outcome of those are. But uh, these are these are serious people like Cyrus Vance that wouldn't bring these cases unless they felt they could win them. So, uh, you know, there's at least an outside chance that he could um, find himself guilty of some of the charges against him. So I think he's, that's going to consume a certain amount of his time. Um, and but I, I have no doubt that he's going to try to continue to to do what he can. And there are reports, of course, that he entertains hopes perhaps of running again in 2024. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what he's been doing uh, over the last three or four months has been with a view, they say, to uh, keeping the sense of grievance and so forth going so that he can then run on that in 2024. So, so I think there will, he'll, he'll continue to try to exercise a role, but one of the really interesting things that's happened just in the last 24 hours is how many Republicans have broken with Trump openly. A lot of his senior staff have left the White House, a lot of people, cabinet officials, uh, Elaine Chao, for example, the Secretary of Transportation, who's married to Mitch McConnell, resigned today. Uh, many of the senators who were standing with Trump have now, uh, you know, parted company with him. So they themselves are beginning to put some distance between themselves and Trump and realize that he's hurt himself a lot in the last two days. Uh, Following so, uh, 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 What, hurting myself? No, no, uh, resigning. <laughs> <laughs> from the administration. <laughs> yes, hopefully I don't face the same lawsuits that he does. Yeah, yeah, but you saw it a lot earlier than they did, right? Yeah. yeah so, so maybe last question for me before before I take the question from from the audience. Of course. Of course. I, I uh, agree with you that Biden's going to need to step up on economic diplomacy, especially with with Asia, and you talked yeah. uh, about, about that. Uh, but yeah. the reality is that the, the United States is shut out of the, some of the important architectures uh, in we Asia, are. out of TPP, right, uh, by its own uh, choice, and yep. also out of the largest trading block uh, in the world, which is uh, RCEP, the Regional yep. Com Economic Partnership. So, so what would be the strategy to overcome that? Because you know, you, you can only do so many bilateral free trade deals, right? Uh, and joining the the larger architecture would be less time consuming and less energy, right? So, so yeah. how would they they make up for that? Well, again, I, I think they're 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 going to take this a little bit slowly. They're they're not going to jump right into this because again, we've got to try to do what we can to to uh, to increase our own competitiveness. Mm. But um, I, I think one of the interesting um, things I've learned in business is that um, the people who are hurt by this are not the big multinational corporations because they have operations around the world. So they can still operate out of Vietnam or they can operate out of Indonesia or they can operate out of, it's really the small and medium sized enterprises in the United States that really rely on these big agreements like TPP. And so I think there is a strategic case to be made to, to join it. But again, the politics of this are, are difficult on the Hill. And they're, they're not, you're not gonna see a, 
a unified Democratic front or even you know unified uh, Republican front. So, so he's going to have to manage this really, really carefully. And I think I, I do believe there is a case to be made to rejoin it, but um, it's going to require some serious work, and he's going to have to think about what his other priorities are versus healthcare, versus uh, infrastructure, versus uh, you know tax cuts, versus you know the some of the big economic recovery programs for COVID. You know, those are also very, very important priorities. And does he want to waste or, or, you know, use some of his uh, leverage on, on trade? Probably not to begin with, but we'll see. Okay. Uh, let's take some questions. Uh, uh, Arfi from uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, what can be done by the upcoming U.S. administration to improve relations with uh, ASEAN countries, uh, especially economic relations? Well, I think we, we've already talked about that. Uh, um, you know, that we're gonna, we're going to try to do what we can to to just um, first get our own uh, act together and um, work together to, um, you know, again encourage our own competitiveness. But in the long run, I do believe we have to to become part of these larger trade agreements. Uh, you're going to see, I'm sure, very vigorous diplomacy by the U.S. Trade Representative and by the Department of Commerce. We've just announced today that uh, the new um, Secretary of Commerce is the very highly regarded um, governor of Rhode Island, a, a woman called Gina Raimundo. And she has a, a very a good economic background and is very, very well respected. So, so I think you're going to see a more concerted approach you're going to see continued efforts to take advantage of programs like the Development Finance Corporation, the U.S. Export Import Bank. Hopefully, use those in more strategic ways uh, so that we can compete with the Chinese and others. Um, and you're going to see very, very active diplomacy to to promote our business overseas and make sure that um, you know we we can compete with the Chinese and but also with our friends, with the Japanese, the Europeans, and others. So, um, so I, you know, even if the trade agenda doesn't, the, the, the trade agreement agenda doesn't start right away, you're going to see very, very active diplomacy, I think, from, from the get-go. Okay. We have a question from Luluk, Wahid Hashim University. How would uh, President Joe Biden in foreign policy see cybersecurity and also with regard to collaboration with other private and government entities? That's a great question. I'm so glad you asked that. Um, you, you may have read that we have just learned of one of the most serious cyber attacks in our history that um, our intelligence services believe was conducted by the Russians. Um, and so there's now a very active forensic investigation that is underway to determine exactly what the purpose of it was and what the um, impact of it was. It appears that it was not an attack to bring down any systems or anything like that, but more just an intelligence gathering operation. But again, it's very, very early in the, in the investigation to figure that out. But it does underline that um, while everybody was focused during the election on the possibility that Russia or China or Iran or somebody else would try to use cyber means to disrupt the election, that never happened, but they appear to have taken their eye off the ball of what was going on elsewhere uh, and the penetration of our system. So it underlines the need to take this very, very seriously. Uh, what Trump, unfortunately, um, disbanded the White House cybersecurity czar position. Uh, President Biden has, has indicated he's going to reinstate that, uh, which is good because you have to have somebody in the White House who's charged every day with overseeing um, cybersecurity efforts in the interagency because it has to be, uh, you know, every single agency has got to be involved. And if there's a, a, a vulnerability anywhere, it's going to infect the entire community. So I, I'm, I'm encouraged that this is going to, again, become a very, very high priority for the next administration. And it, it has to. It's 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 the most one of the most important things that we can do, not only to protect our government but to protect our companies and our trade secrets, and so many other things. Okay. Uh, next question is from uh, Stephanie. 
uh, Biden has not specifically said about the United States joining COVAX. In your opinion, how will Biden balance between domestic pressure to handle the pandemic, to properly vaccinate the Americans, while ensuring the U.S. leadership in global efforts for equitable global vaccine distribution? It's true that he hasn't said that, but I think that you know his his temperament is such that um, he he believes in multilateral approaches to these kinds of global challenges. So I think it would be natural for the United States under a Biden administration to join COVAX. Um, of course, uh, many of our companies are leading the world in terms of developing these vaccines. So there's um, there's going to be a very uh, active competition to uh, not only get access to those vaccines, but also to understand how we can um, really build up um, production of the vaccines once they've been approved by the Food and Drug Administration and other regulatory authorities. And again, we have significant um, opportunities and significant capabilities in that area. So I'm, I, I, really mu I very much hope that uh, one of the priorities of the new administration will be to look at that uh, and to, to not only, of course, make sure that all Americans have access to, to these life-saving vaccines, but that we also work with COVAX, with companies around the world, with large producers like Germany, which of course has its own very substantial capabilities, to um, figure out how to ramp up um, uh, these the production of these vaccines so that access can be uh, accelerated and enhanced because the, the, the economy is not going to recover and we're not going to get beyond this terrible, terrible virus until we can uh, make sure that everybody has access to the vaccine. And I, th I think one of the most, one of the saddest things is that we, we do face a, a problem of inequality where particularly many African countries, but other low-income countries are gonna, are gonna be much later in receiving the vaccine than countries like the United States. So that's something that uh, I think all of us have to be concerned about and make sure that we try to address as, as quickly as possible. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you, Bob, because uh, you know, we just ended our year-end press statement at the FPCI and, and we believe that uh, the vaccine, uh, the COVID-19 situation will get uh, worse uh, uh, in the coming months, and it has gotten worse, including in Indonesia. And we think also vaccine diplomacy, vaccine nationalism, and vaccine politics uh, will be the, the dominant issues uh, in 2021. And if the United States first foreign policy moves are all about other things other than the, the COVID-19 or vaccine issue globally, uh, the perception will be that, hey, you know, you're, you're, you're missing the boat. You know, everybody else is, you know, Absolutely. doing this thing and you're doing other things, you know, right? Absolutely. So, so it's very important. And I, I, let me just make one more point, you know, which is um, the other, uh, I think, somewhat alarming development is that new strains of these, uh, of, of COVID are now uh, yes. uh, coming out. So we've seen one in South Africa, one in, in the UK, um, and, and these are now much more highly infectious strains of the virus. Mm -hmm. And also in the case of the South Africa one, less susceptible to treatment by the existing vaccines. So um, I, I think that all of the bonhomie about how the, you know, the world is gonna recover by June of, of 2021, we, we need to be careful about that because I think we've, there's still quite a number of challenges ahead, not just on the vaccine distribution front, but on the mutations of these exactly. viruses. And uh, for example, the UK has just announced its own second or maybe third now lockdown. More than half of the uh, people who were affected by, uh, by the, because of the lockdown were from this new virus. So it spread just like wildfire through, through the United Kingdom. And so, and of course it's now been detected in I think 33 countries. So. So it's a it's a very very serious problem that we're going. That's another issue that everybody's going to have to follow very closely, and again another one that calls for very good global coordination and information sharing. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I have a question from Ivan Korompis. How will President 
Biden repair the damage that has been done to U.S. democracy. Obviously, I think he's referring to what happened uh, yesterday, especially uh, in terms of uh, the U.S. democratic standing in the world. Yeah. Well, uh, you heard me talk in my in my remarks about some of the things he's going to do right away, uh, such as stopping the the practice of of separating uh, parents from their 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 children uh, at U.S. ports of entry, particularly with with Central America and Mexico. Um, but, you know, I think there, there's a lot to be done. And uh, let me just, since we're, you know, every, the, sort of the elephant in the room is this, this Capitol Hill violence. Let me, let me just make a couple of observations about that. Um, I, I think the most important thing for all of you to understand is that as, as disgraceful and as sad as that spectacle was, um, our system of constitutional law bended but did not break. In the end, the US Congress certified Biden's victory last night at 3.30 in the morning and thereby finalized the election process. Biden will be our next president on January 20th. Um, sadly, I think right-wing media that support Trump, like the One America News Networks, Network and Newsmax, continue to peddle falsehoods about blaming left-wing activists, blaming the media, even blaming poor Vice President Pence, who's been so loyal uh, for the violence that took place yesterday, instead of blaming the pro-Trump rioters. And I think because of the Trump's steady stream of falsehoods, and because of these media, our country's going to remain divided. Um, you know, I, I read a, a, an awful statistics the other day that a staggering 52% of white males in America believe that Trump won the elections. So Biden has a big job ahead to try to heal these divisions and to help these people understand that they haven't been forgotten and that he cares about their welfare and that he's gonna do his best to make sure that they are part of uh, the American recovery, that they receive the training they need if they need to be retrained um, and that they are kind of brought back into the economic mainstream because I think that is at the root a lot of, of a lot of the anger that a lot of these people um, are expressing against our institutions and our system of government. Uh, and so that's, that's going to be a very, very important priority for the president. Um, I think the president himself is such a decent man, President Biden, that people, and he's has himself been a, such a strong supporter for so long about on human rights and other issues that um, people will, will understand that uh, our institutions are back in solid hands. And, um, and I think we'll begin to, again, rebuild, rebuild our credibility and rebuild our, our, um, our reputation. Um, because who's the person who's president really does matter. And the, the words that come out of his or her mouth really do matter. And I, and I think uh, he's going to do his very best to, to, to demonstrate that on a daily basis. And so I, I'm, I'm really not that worried about reclaiming our credibility. I think that that will come relatively quickly. And you'll see it through his actions. Yes, yeah. I, I really hope so because, you know, as you and I know, uh, uh, who work in the field of diplomacy, there are really not a lot of countries in the world that can move things in 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 a big way, uh, and the United States is certainly one of them. You know, your diplomatic yeah. resources, your yeah. economic resource, the technological yeah. resource, your ability to what do you call it, mobilize countries? Mobilize people. Yeah, that's that's really uh, unbelievable. It's something that we miss because the United States sure. is pulling out of uh, a lot of things. Uh, let, let me let me ask a closing uh, question that then. Sure. Uh, Bob, uh, you know, the last four years uh, has been uh, quite uh, confusing for me uh, and maybe for many others because we saw a different kind of uh, U.S. nationalism, right? Uh, and President Trump seems uh, to have found a way to awaken some nerves, raw nerves in, in certain base of American society uh, and frame it as uh, the patriotic 
American uh, nationalism. Uh, but, but I think for many of us outside America and for many inside the United States, you know, it's seen as a, an arrogant, uh, intolerant, uh, narrow-minded and macho nationalism, right? At least that's how, how we see it from that side. Sure. And sure. I'm just wondering, uh, as, you know, somebody uh, who lives in, in the United States, and especially in Washington, and, you know, you feel the beat of what is happening in the United States. What, what kind of nationalism will emerge now uh, in the next four years under the Biden administration? Yeah, I, I think you're going to see a lot less chest thumping by, uh, by the next administration and a lot more effort to work with uh, our friends and allies around the world, including Indonesia, on the, the problems that the, the world faces. Um, and I, I, again, I, I go back to that study that I talked about that, that Bill Burns undertook with Carnegie where they went out and, and talked to people in the, in the middle of our country, in the heartland of our country, in places like Nebraska. And I was encouraged that those people still believe that the United States has an important role to play, but that we also have to be more humble. And we have to be, we have to understand that um, there's never gonna be another effort like Iraq where we think we can go in and topple a government and install by some magic formula, a democratic government that is suddenly going to be friendly to the United States. Those things just don't work. It's too hard. And we overestimate our, our capabilities and we end up getting dragged into long wars that uh, claim many, many American lives and lose uh, and hurt our reputation around the world. And nobody knows that better than Joe Biden. So. Um, you know, he argued, consistently argued against expanding troop levels in places like Afghanistan and Iraq and elsewhere. Um, and so I, I do think that we're, gonna, we're entering a period where certainly we're all still proud to be Americans, but we're, we're going to try to work as much as possible with our friends and allies to solve these common problems that we have. And you're going to see much less of a sort of macho you're not gonna see any more of the sort of America go it alone, much more of a cooperative and, and, and uh, hopefully successful foreign policy under the next Biden administration. And again, the, the team that he is assembling has tremendous experience um, and has you know, lived and worked around the world. So I, I, I really am optimistic that we're gonna see quite a sea change um, in, in the next several months. And uh, that's good news for not only for the United States, but good news for the rest of the world as well. Yeah, so I think that's the key word, sea change. And, and finally, Bob, uh, you know, we, we miss you in Indonesia. What, what do you miss most about, about uh, Indonesia or Indonesia? Uh, gosh, I, there's, I miss everything about Indonesia. I mean, I, I haven't been able to travel there for almost you know, nine months now. So it's been really terrible. And, you know, I, I just, well, I frankly, I just, mostly I miss my friends. You know, I think um, one, one, of the, one of the best things was how warm everybody was in Indonesia and how, um, you know, how open people are. They're just, uh, it's just a lovely, lovely country to live in. And, um, and everybody has, has got a good sense of humor. And it was always a, a great relief to leave the partisanship and bickering of Washington DC and fly to Indonesia, you know, on business or when, when I was working for Yusindo or whatever. Uh, I, I really treasured those, those visits. And uh, I hope I, I can do that again soon because it's, um, you know, Indonesia has got so much going for it and the people are warm and friendly and there are so many beautiful things to see in your country and, um, I, I envy your our new ambassador, Sung Kim, who's, by the way, is just a wonderful guy. Yes. And yes. it's going to be a terrific ambassador. So um, yes. So I just I, I just want to send my very best to many Indonesian friends I know who are listening tonight on the on the line and tell you that I miss you and I look forward to seeing you again soon, I hope, when international travel is permitted. And uh, in the meantime, I just wish you um, a speedy recovery as I wish my own country. And I think that uh, 
better days are ahead for all of us. Yeah, I, I know I, you are one of the American ambassadors who traveled the most uh, because I remember when you just arrived in Indonesia, you just hit the road, you went everywhere, right? And uh, not just visiting cities, but you know, you climb mountains oh, yeah. and you visited islands and so on. I, I, just out of curiosity, because you know, that's what I did too when I worked at the palace, right? Uh, yeah. So we've seen a lot of Indonesia, but can you name one place uh, that you think uh, took your breath away, the most beautiful uh, place that will last forever? And don't worry, we won't take it. Other, other, other places won't take it personally. Uh, uh, if you say it's not Bali or whatever, you know, uh, but I really like to know of all those places, which, which one really uh, impressed? It would, have to be, it would have to be Papua. Is that right? Yeah. Which part? Um, well, uh, many of them. Mm. Um, we went there, we went down to a place around Sorong, uh, you know, it's south of Sorong. There's some beautiful islands down there, mm -hmm. but also in the um, bird's head landscape. It's just an, one of the most extraordinary places in, in, in all of the world. Uh, and so the diving, but also the natural landscapes and again, just the warm, warm people. It, you know, my, my kids still talk about the trips that we took to Papua. And, but, but there were many, many others. I mean, we, we, we loved going to uh, Sulawesi. We loved going to, of course, many times to Labuan Bajo, mm -hmm. uh, Bali, of course. Bali ba is a little overcrowded, so I wouldn't go to South Bali anymore, but mm -hmm. the rest of Bali is still lovely. And there, you know, there's just unlimited beautiful places to go. And, and then you, you, know, you go to these very remote places like the, the west coast of Sumatra. That entire west coast is some of the most beautiful landscapes you'll ever see and you know very few people ever get to them but lovely lovely things to see and do there yeah well we hope uh, to see you in, uh, in indonesia bob unfortunately there's not much traveling going on these days no, it's not going to be no. long, right and uh, okay dina well thank you very much for the opportunity you, uh, on behalf of fpci and i hope uh, you will continue to talk to uh, fpci community uh, you know uh, throughout uh, 2021 We're and for those who don't know, uh, um, Bob and I are, we belong to at least two uh, important international organizations. One is uh, World Resource Institute, uh, which is based in Washington, DC, and it's said to be the best think tank in the world on sustainable development. And the other one is we're also on the board of uh, USINDO uh, that is dedicated to US-Indonesia uh, relations. So, and also congratulations, Bob, because uh, your daughter, uh, oldest daughter has been admitted to Princeton. Uh, I'm very envious because uh, those are uh, university that re would reject me. <laughs> I don't have enough. <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, please say hi to Sophia and the whole family and all our friends in Washington, D.C. Thank uh, you. And stay safe, Bob. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great to talk to you.